All right, James 1.5 says, but if any of you all are lacking of wisdom, and that's doctrine in the viewpoint area of your soul, uh, keep on asking from the immediate source of God who keeps on giving to all men without reservation and who keeps on not reproaching and it will be given to him. So all we have to do is ask for it and uh, he will provide it. That's part of God's plan. He wants everybody to reach maturity. He wants everybody to have the opportunity to take in doctrine. If you're not getting doctrine, that's your fault. It's not God's. God provides it to everybody, okay? He provides the gospel to every unbeliever, and then once you become a believer, he provides doctrinal teaching to everybody. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to be, uh, you know, 15 yards from your house or something like that. You may have to go find it, okay? But you are going to have the opportunity for doctrinal information, okay? And uh, we also know from John 4, 24, that God's spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. What that means is that we have to be filled with God, the Holy Spirit, we have to be in what's called the divine dinosphere, the power sphere from God. We have to be able to have a relaxed mental attitude. Uh, we've got to take in the information that we're going to hear and not be not be uh, uh, trying to fight it, not trying to uh, find fault with it, but instead taking it in, comparing it against the doctrine that you already have, and, and then uh, accepting it and cycling it, letting God, the Holy Spirit, cycle it from your human spirit up into your soul where it can become your information i'm wobbling we had we had a workout this morning and my legs are about done but anyway <laughs> and of course though the place where this wisdom is given is here it's at this church uh, that's where we get the divine dinosphere uh, that's where you should be in divine dinosphere and you should be able to uh, take in the truth of the word of god so just <clears throat> In case you need to rebound or do any other, make any other necessary decision uh, before you study, we are going to take our normal few moments of silence, which gives you the opportunity to do that and to be ready to uh, take in this information that we're going to get today and be able to cycle it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that once again, from your perfect faithfulness, you recognized our every need and our capacities. Then in fulfillment of the great plan that you have provided for us, you've given us another opportunity to gather together as a local church to study your word. Then as a result of its application, to develop capacities for life, love, happiness, blessing, service, and to handle problems and pressures in our future. We understand that the lessons we're studying lately have a lot of warnings of hard times, and we see our nation going down like Joshua did, but we also know from Joshua 1.9, where you tell us, do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Therefore, we ask now that God the Holy Spirit would provide for each of us concentration, self-discipline, genuine humility for the purpose of study, but also to give us courage to understand that what we are studying is for our advancement, for our betterment, and not to discourage us. As you told us in John 16, 33, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be having confidence, I have overcome the world. We thank you for this time to study then and to develop that peace. <clears throat> and we thank you through Christ's name. Amen. Okay, we are obviously studying <clears throat> in Second Peter 3. We're down through verse 7, starting at the very beginning. We have 1 and 2. This is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you all, which I am <clears throat> attempting to stir up, slant, Stimulate, slant, motivate. You're uncontaminated, and that's biblically, biblically indoctrinated, thought by means of remembrance, slant review, so that you might recall the word, slant doctrine, having been previously communicated by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior communicated by your apostles. First of all, keep on knowing this, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, functioning according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his arrival? Certainly, if ever since the fathers fell asleep, all the things remain just as they were from the beginning of creation. Remember, that's what they're saying. And now the rest of the chapter, a big part of the chapter is Peter uh, can, you know, answering this question and showing these mockers how foolish they are for the statement that they've made. Okay, the, uh, since creation, things have changed considerably. <laughs> okay, And so he starts off saying, now they deliberately keep on ignoring this fact that by means of the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was reassembled out from water and through water, through the instrumentality of which the world at that time was destroyed after having been flooded with water. So first we have creation, 
Okay, then we have restoration where it's re where it's reassembled out from the water and through the water, uh, where we have the ice caps melting finally and the water coming in and the earth being formed and everything. And then we have that water once again being used uh, in the flood and taking us out to the flood. Verse 7, but the present heavens and earth by means of this same word keep on having been reserved for fire. And I forgot to go in and that word should be uh, uh, capitalized for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and of destruction of the ungodly men. And that's, <clears throat> we had gotten seven. Let's see if I can get here, whoops. Let's see if I can get here faster. Ah. Okay, well, <clears throat> get down to where we were. Sorry. So, verse 7, But the present heavens and earth, by means of the same word, keep on having been reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and a destruction of ungodly men. And then we saw in point 1, that the verse continues Peter's presentation of God's active presence in human history. Remember, we aren't deists. You know, deists believe that God created everything, put it all in, in place, and then sat back and watched just to see what was going to happen, what man was going to do. He didn't really, he doesn't really influence anything. He just watches. Uh, many of our founding fathers, unfortunately, were deists, but they at least had enough doctrine to, to properly function with regard to the laws of divine establishment and establish this country. But the idea is that God is not a deist. He is active in the, in the world that he created. Okay. So he has presented original creation, then the flood, and now he's going to present the destruction of the world after the great white throne judgment or the last judgment. Point two, from verses five through seven, we can actually see the first three of the four civilizations and the judgment of these of two of these, with the other judgment being implied. In each judgment, the world is cleared of all unbelievers, and the civilization is started with believers only. And so I gave you uh, the different uh, <clears throat> things, antediluvian, the end of the antediluvian, the end of the postdiluvian, and the millennial. And then we went over the actual graph, okay, and saw the civilizations, the ages, and the dispensations. <clears throat> uh, and then in point four, we saw that Peter then refers to God, specifically the pre-incarnate Christ, once again, when he states by means of this same word, and again, words should be capitalized uh, in, the, in the passage, with a noted fact that he emphasized this same, and I gave you some points associated with that. Uh, Christ created, Christ going to destroy, mockers continue uh, to not believe, really, in confidence that man cannot destroy uh, the earth. In other words, there's nothing that we're going to do that's going to destroy this earth uh, or the universe even. Okay, we've got uh, people now who are probably going to start being afraid because NASA is starting to do more uh, studies in space. Now they're going to go, oh, you're not going to destroy the earth, you're going to destroy space. You know, I heard the other day that uh, NASA is looking at putting a hotel on the moon. I wonder how much a reservation for that is. <laughs> the reservation's really cheap. It's the trip to get there that's going to cost you. <laughs> Point five says, next Peter gives us the emphasized phrase, keep on having been reserved. And this is actually another Peter's technical uses of the Greek. And I gave you some information associated with that. So point A, he said, if we understand that God took water from the store of the earth to create the flood and then kept those waters upon the earth as seas and as means of rains, then we understand that the center of the earth with the shortage of water is now ready to turn into a ball of fire. Uh, we, I talked a little bit about mag magma and volcanoes, and I gave you a, 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 a example of the amount of uh, plutonium and uranium that's needed with the two atomic bombs that took out uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki and compared that to what's uh, actually in the center of the earth and what's on our surface. It doesn't take much to see that we uh, have enough material there to destroy not only earth but the entire heavens and earth, the entire universe. Point six then said the words for fire confirm that the heaven and earth will be destroyed by fighter, fire. Peter made the parallel between the flood and the fire to show the different ways that God punishes unbelievers. And give some more information there. Point seven. How far down did we go? Oh, we're at point ten. Okay. Point seven. Being kept for the day of judgment tells us several things. First, being kept implies that someone's doing the keeping. Of course, that's God. 
Subpoint B, uh, the day of judgment <clears throat> that he used, it's the same thing that he used in 2.9, and the day of judgment is associated with the great white throne or the end of the millennium. Point eight says, and finally we have the destruction of ungodly men. Subpoint A tells us about unrighteous and ungodly. Subpoint B says the Greek, again, uses the word apolumi to speak of destruction of the earth. And here he uses apolia when he's speaking about judgment of people. So we see there's uh, uh, two judgments. That are, the judgment's going to come in two parts. First, we have the judgment of the unbeliever, given in Revelation 20, 12 through 15. And second, we have the judgment of the earth, given in Revelation 21, 1. And we see in subpoint D that Peter fills in the gap between these two passages. See, in Revelation, it doesn't tell us exactly what's going to happen. It just tells us that heaven and earth is destroyed, and then it tells us that the people are, are going to be destroyed, right? Well, <clears throat> uh, Peter uh, gives us the information in chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, uh, to fill in what was missing in that gap. Subpoint E, Peter makes it very clear that those who will be destroyed are unbelievers by his use of the adjective uh, asabes or ungodly. Point nine, we have correction in point nine. Point nine says, with the beginning of chapter three complete, Peter has made, um, thank you for calling it to my attention, for the, the be, well, excuse me, <clears throat> start over. With the beginning of chapter three complete, Peter has made it clear that there is a difference between the believer and the unbeliever, and that the unbeliever can look forward to his personal end at the last judgment. Through this passage and those of Paul, is what I said, I meant to say John, I was pointed out that I said through, the, through the, this passage and those of Paul, and then I gave you uh, all kinds of verses from Revelation, which Paul, of course, didn't write. It was John. So <clears throat> through this passage and those of John, we know colon. And then I gave you uh, three, six, seven subpoints. Human race is divided, believer and unbeliever. The unbeliever is under condemnation. Uh, the unbeliever has two appointments, physical death and judgment, or the second death. The unbeliever has a resurrection. The unbeliever uh, has an indictment, or he's under indictment. And the unbeliever has an eternal future, okay, of course. And then finally, the unbeliever has an eternal condemnation. And I gave you passages mostly out of Revelation. There's a John passage in there and a Hebrews passage. And with that... We're now ready to pick up with point 10. Point 10. Peter has not called out the back. Peter has not called out the baptism of fire specifically in these passages, semicolon. However, comma, the implication is that the great white throne judgment, GWTJ, <laughs> the implication is that the great white throne judgment cannot occur until after the millennium, comma, which occurs after the baptism of fire, period. His parallel with the flood and, remo and removal of unbelievers holds for both the baptism of fire and the end of the millennium. Subpoint so A. The mockers are refusing, comma, 
or choosing to ignore, comma, both the baptism of fire and the great white throne judgment. I haven't done uh, a in, you know, in-depth study into uh, all millennialists or uh, or uh, post-millennialists, but and I probably should. That's probably a weakness in my my theological study, so I put that on my list of things to do. But I don't understand how they can they can understand the difference between the baptism of fire and the great white throne judgment if they don't have a millennium that's stuck in the middle of those two. Right, it, it's it's uh, impossible for me to to fathom it, and that and they probably don't. That's probably the answer is they don't, and that's why we have confusion on the idea of one is taken and one is left, and you know things like that. That they don't understand the rapture, they don't understand the baptism of fire, and they don't understand the great white throne judgment. And so it's important for us to properly interpret the Word of God to understand uh, God's division of history. Of, of human history so that we can clearly understand what's being talked about when God is talking, when Christ is talking, for example, in the New Testament. What is he talking about? And we're going to get some information associated with that. Okay. <clears throat> so the mockers are refusing or choosing to ignore both the baptism of fire, after the, uh, and that's after the second advent, and the great white throne judgment. Subpoint B, the baptism of fire is part of the information that these believers excuse me <clears throat> sorry I skipped a spot baptism of fire is part of the information that Peter expects these believers to have already been taught At the time of writing, the Gospels had been written and distributed and taught to the churches. So Peter doesn't hit <clears throat> on that information. See, in this, this area here, he's not talking about the baptism of fire as much as he's talking about the great white throat judgment. Okay, So Peter doesn't hit on that information. However, the destruction of the heavens and earth as presented in Revelation is yet to be written by the Apostle John. Now remember, Revelation goes into a lot more detail, but as we've seen in our study of the Old Testament, in the Old Testament you have Samuel, you have Isaiah, you have those prophets who are talking about the, uh, the destruction of the heavens and the earth and the new heaven and the new earth, the new Jerusalem, right? They, they do talk about that. And so these individuals who are uh, Jews in diaspora, the Jews who have been dis dispersed, uh, they, are, they are Jewish believers now. Remember, that's who Peter's writing to. The, those five churches in Asia Minor are filled with Jews who have been uh, dispersed. Uh, they, if they understand the Torah, they do understand a little bit about the great white throne judgment. Okay, but Peter's going to, like I said, fill in the gap 
that's uh, in Revelation. Of course, Revelation hasn't been written yet. So he's giving them a little bit of, uh, of uh, uh, pre-information that fills in what they have known from the Old Testament. He's going to give this, and then, of course, John's going to flesh it out later. <clears throat> so, the however, the destruction of the heavens and the earth as presented in Revelation is not yet written by the Apostle John. Teaches, continuing the point, so Peter teaches a little about this informa new information. With the understanding... that they know the baptism of fire had to come first. Subpoint C, for our edification, let's look at information concerning the baptism of fire. See, we've, we've studied the dispensations and, and the different events in the dispensation, but uh, this is going to be just basically on the baptism of fire. So, <clears throat> remember, uh, the baptism of fire is here, <clears throat> right here, okay? Uh, for those of you that are on the screen, go to the right and look a little bit to the to the left. Okay, it's at the second advent is where we have the baptism of fire. It ends the post diluvian uh, civilization. Uh, remember, we have civilization, ages, and dispensations. It ends the post diluvian civilization. It also ends the Jewish age. That's why it's in the Old Testament. Remember, we have the fact that the church is what's called intercalated. That's why on this picture it's shown as a parenthesis in parentheses, is it was jammed into the middle of, not middle, but at the very end of the Jewish uh, uh, age, okay? The Jewish age still was 490 years, still has uh, uh, seven years to go, and that's the tribulation. That's the shortened seven years. Uh, but before the, the tribulation, because uh, the, the uh, things were going to get so bad uh, that the church age was interjected, okay? So you still have the Jewish age to be finished. And that's why uh, in the Old Testament, since it was done during the Jewish age, that's why during that time period you had some information about the great white throne judgment as well as a little bit about the baptism of fire. Then in dispensations, we have the various dispensations, which I'm not going to teach today. Okay, But what we're really looking at is right there, the second advent of Christ and the baptism of fire. <laughs> okay, so And it has to come before the great white throne judgment because it initiates the millennium and, uh, and, and goes, which then uh, ends with the great white throne judgment, we go into eternal. Yeah, the, the, uh, the font, when you go sideways like that in, uh, in uh, JPEG, just for some reason doesn't look really good when you enlarge it. But anyway, that's where we're at. Yeah, my, my little, uh, uh, what, that technique that they call it, they call that the, uh, the technique named after the guy that does the PBS specials, uh, like baseball and... Ken Burns, that's called the Ken Burns effect, because he does that a lot where he'll show something and then he pulls it and goes, yeah. <laughs> so, so if you look up the Ken Burns effect, that's what you get. Anyway, <clears throat> I wasn't trying to be fancy fancy. I just wanted to focus where we were going. Okay. So sub point C is, uh, is uh, for our edification. Let's look at the information concerning the baptism of fire. Sub point one, one with single parents around it. The baptism of fire is related to the second advent. And will end the post-Diluvian civilization, comma, the Jewish age, and the dispensation of the tribulation. So it ends all three of the types of divisions of history that we have. It ends a civilization, an age, and a dispensation. Sub point two, two with single parents around it. This judgment, excuse me, removes the unbelievers from the earth. Period. 
If you need to, you can, if you, if you get confused, you can underline unbelievers. This judgment removes the unbelievers from the earth. Period. It is not to be confused with the rapture. in which the believers are removed. See, people who don't understand dispensations will talk about the second coming, and you never know what they're talking about when they talk about the second coming. If they're talking about the rapture, or they're talking about the, uh, the second advent. The second coming should be the second advent, okay? But they'll talk about, oh, when we go to meet the Lord at, the, you know, at his second coming. No, we're not going to meet the Lord at his second coming. The Lord doesn't touch the earth in the rapture. We meet him in the sky because if he were to touch the earth, that is an advent, okay? So it is not to be confused with the rapture in which the believers are removed. And this point is a point of confusion in many of the traditional church interpretations of Scripture and in many of the commentaries. I have that sentence, but I'm not going to go slow enough for you to have to put it in your notes. <laughs> you, you get the point. Subpoint three. <clears throat> there are three statements that refer to the baptism of fire, colon. Matthew 3, 11 through 12, compared with Luke 3, 16 and 17. In which the, quote, threshing floor, end quote, is the earth comma the wheat the quote wheat end quote represents the believers comma the quote barn end quote equates to the millennium, and the quote chaff, end quote, equates to unbelievers. Semicolon. So there are three statements that refer to the baptism of fire, and I gave you three passages, in which the threshing floor is the earth, the wheat represents the believers, the barn equals the millennium, and the chaff equates to the unbelievers. So the passage says, as for me, I bat this is, this is uh, John the baptizer talking, as for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you, baptize you with the Holy Spirit, that's for believers, and fire. That's for the unbelievers. See, a lot of people don't read that in that passage. They don't understand that. Verse 12 then goes, uh, goes on to say, and his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear the threshing floor. That's the earth. Okay. And he will gather his wheat into the barn. So the believers are going to go into the millennium. And, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Okay. So I ended with a semicolon. Following the semicolon, and 2 Thessalonians 1, seven through 10, which is self-explanatory. Starting at verse 6, it says, For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to give relief to you who are afflicted, and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven 
with his mighty angels in flaming fire. Verse 8, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9, and these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed, for our testimony to you was believed. To this end, we pray for you always that our God may count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power. So, verse, uh, so verse, uh, Excuse me. Subpoint three said there are three statements that refer to the baptism of fire in Matthew 3, 11 and 12, compared with Luke 3, 16 and 17, in which the threshing floor is the earth. The wheat represents the believers. The barn equals the millennium and the chaff equates to unbelievers, semicolon and second Thessalonians 1, 7 through 10, which is self-explanatory, period. Subpoint four. We also have Matthew 24, 36 through 41, period. This is often equated to the rapture. But that's wrong. This is the baptism of fire. And it's equated to the flood. Similar to what Peter has done. You know, Peter's technically talking about the, uh, the great white throne judgment, but he's also alluding to the baptism of fire because he understands that the Lord Jesus Christ has taught these individuals uh, with this parable about the baptism of fire and the flood, this comparison of the flood. Okay? So continue, continuing the point. What is being said in this math, Matthew passage is that prior to the flood, people were enjoying themselves. Which is not wrong, per se. But they were doing this more than thinking of or worshiping God, period. There is a direct analogy here. That's between the people before the flood and the baptism of fire. Okay, So there's a direct analogy here. The people will be living their lives and doing their jobs and not worshiping God then the baptism of fire will hit So we can see some of that in our time now. Now I'm not saying that you know the baptism of fire and the rapture and everything's going to come here, you know, real soon. <laughs> okay, uh, but but the idea is, look at our society right now. You have very little worship of God. You have very little uh, uh, praise 
and understanding of the blessings that he has provided for us in this country, for example. The freedoms that we have. We allow these freedoms to just be taken away. We're allowing our government to tax us to death, to pay for things that citizens, uh, uh, only citizens, should get, right? But yet our government is, is looking at, oh, well, we've got all these illegal aliens. Now we need to give them free education. Now we need to give them free medical. Now we need to give them, who's paying for that? Right? Citizenship is a law of divine establishment concept. A country is supposed to have citizens that it protects. And it protects it from who? From those who aren't citizens. Are we being protected from those who aren't citizens? No. Why? Because we have leaders who don't understand the truth of the word of God, who don't understand the laws of divine establishment. We have people who are living their lives by uh, uh, living with their partner. Okay, whatever that is, right? Uh, we have uh, people uh, idolizing those kinds of people in Hollywood, right? You have people that for a long time were, oh, I wish I could have a marriage like like uh, Will and Jada Smith, right? You know, they haven't been they haven't been with each other for seven years, over seven years. All they do is put up a front, right? And she calls out in public all the time how she goes and sleeps around with other guys and he doesn't mind. That's the kind of worship you want to have? Those are the kind of people you want to emulate? See, we have people worshiping the wrong things. But, hey, they're living their lives, they're paying their rent, they're doing their jobs, but it's not what God designed. Okay? Many of them are not in the jobs that they're supposed to be in. Probably half of Silicon Valley isn't supposed to be there. You want to talk about, you know, it used to be Washington, D.C. was one of the worst uh, satanic places. It's Silicon Valley. All the technology that's come out of there and has been used for satanic uh, 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 things. The Internet, right? Number one business in the United States is pornography, followed secondly by human trafficking. You have TikTok run by the, Jap by the uh, Chinese. Uh, they won't let it in their country but they bring it into our country so that you can have all of these uh, stupid uh, influencers. They're influencing the wrong thing, right? How many influencers influence the truth of the Word of God? You have Mulvaney, right, who gets all mad because people won't accept him as a woman. <laughs> what an idiot, okay? Uh, anyway, this passage, 24, 30, <clears throat> 36 through 41, says, But of that day and hour no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. See, that's not talking about the rapture. People want to do that, want to call that the rapture. It's not. It's a baptism of fire. But we know that when the baptism of fire occurs, I mean, if we were to know when the baptism of fire occurs, we could count back and figure out where the rapture might occur. Okay. Anyway, it says, But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father knows. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days which were before the flood, they were eating and drinking. They were marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. So there's nothing wrong with those things. But you notice he doesn't say they were worshiping. Okay? And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Okay? <clears throat> then there shall be two men in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. The one who's taken, okay, is destroyed by the baptism of fire, and he's the unbeliever, okay? Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, one will be left. Same thing. The one taken is the unbeliever. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming, okay? So, there's a direct analogy here. Uh, continuing the point, uh, I, the, the last part you should have says, and then the baptism of fire will hit, period, right? I gave you all that? Okay. Picking up from there. The ones who are taken are unbelievers. And the ones who are left are believers going into the millennium. The command in verse 42 to quote, be on the alert, end quote, uh, 
is for the believer to be ready at any time for the baptism of fire. Period. So, so what you're going to have okay, is you're going to have these individuals, right? And, and uh, many of them are going to be around when the rapture occurs. So the rapture occurs and woof, there's people gone, right? And who's gone? The believers. So the person that's on earth is an unbeliever. He looks around, he says, uh-oh, <laughs> I heard about this. Uh-oh, my friends told me about this. Uh-oh, there was a series of books that I read called Left Behind or whatever the book in the series is called. Okay, uh, 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 this, this is not good. <laughs> okay, and so you have 144,000 that immediately uh, become evangelists, right? You know, and then you have people that start accepting Christ uh, through the tribulation. And so you have this, the shortened seven years of the tribulation. And so now you have these tribulational believers, right? And so they're, they're going along and, and maybe, who knows, maybe some of them are in their 60s or 70s, right? You know, and they're, they're, they make it through the, the tribulation, right? And then, and then whoop, people are gone again. <laughs> you know, no. Only now, now it's the believers. I mean, it's the unbelievers, right? Not the believers. Now it's the, the unbelievers and they're, they're still left, right? You know, go, uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. But now instead of going, uh-oh, actually, they go, whoo. Okay, dodge that one, <laughs> right? You know, they're they're left on the earth. Now they're going into the millennium, and uh, potentially they could they could uh, live for a thousand years, right? So they could be a thousand and seventy years old if they accepted Christ at seventy in the tribulation, right? Maybe a thousand and seventy years old, right? You know, and then you have the great white throne judgment. <laughs> yeah. You know? and, uh, so anyway. <clears throat> You get the idea. This poor, you know, not poor, but this person might uh, see people disappear. So they need to understand uh, who, who, you know, they need to be on the alert. Uh, if they've made it into the tribulation, they need to be on alert, on alert for, uh, you know, the uh, baptism of fire. Okay. Point five. So point five, five single parents are on it. Many of the parables deal with the baptism of fire. Some point, little a. For example, Matthew 13, 24 through 30. And its explanation in verses 36 through 43. where Christ tells us that the wheat are believers of the tribulation and the tares you hear this about the parable of the wheat and the tares and the tares T A R E S are the unbelievers who experience the baptism of fire. So in Matthew 20, uh, 13, 24, we have, He presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares also among the wheat and went away. Now, of course, that's the implication there is Satan, uh, you know, confounding the good information. But when the wheat sprang up and bore grain, then the tares became evident. And the slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, an enemy has done this. Of course, the enemy is Satan, like I said. And the slaves said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather the, them up? But he said, No, lest while you are gathering up the tares, you may root 
<clears throat> root up or uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first, gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up. That's the baptism of fire. But gather the wheat into my barn. And again, the barn is going into the millennium. And then in verse 36, it says, the tares explained. Then he left the multitudes and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered and said, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. And the field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Therefore, just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. Okay? So, <clears throat> we get the idea. <laughs> okay? It's very, very clear to us. <clears throat> Now, verses 41 through 43, I guess I only I stopped at 40. 41 says, The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out his kingdom, all stumbling blocks, and those who commit lawlessness. And he will cast them into the furnace of fire. In that place there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of the Father. He who has ears, let him hear. So going into the kingdom of the Father, we're talking about the millennium here. Okay? So... <clears throat> It's good when uh, not only does he give you the parable, but he explains it for you. <laughs> anyway, subpoint little b. Then we have Matthew 13, 47 through 50. In which, in which the good fish are believers. who go into the container of the millennium and the bad fish are unbelievers who are thrown away. Starting at 40, 47, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. And when it was filled, they drew it up on the beach and they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay. Subpoint little c. We also have the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25, 1 through 13. is a challenge to the unbeliever of the tribulation to believe in Christ. I'm going to go ahead this time. I'm going to go ahead and read it first. And then I'll tell you what everybody is, because you'll, you'll be able to figure it out yourself because you're really smart, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. Okay. <clears throat> so 25, 1 through 13 says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, you have to understand the bridal ceremony of the ancient Near East or, the, or, or this time period. Okay. What would happen is the bridegroom, would, his, his uh, friends would have already started a party at his house, right? And he would go, and he would go to the home of the bride, and he would pick her up from her family, and he would escort her uh, to his own home, and he would, you know, carry her over the threshold into his home, and she would join the party, and they would, and that's the marriage. There was no 
you know, priest and a ceremony and all that stuff. It was just, he took her from her, her parents' house. He brought her and he brought her into the, the, uh, the uh, home, his home. Okay. And now she became his, his wife. And there would already be partying going on, sort of like a, a frat type thing going on, right? You know, as bros. <laughs> and, 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 and then you'd also have her, you know, so you'd have, those were the, those were the groomsmen, okay? You didn't have them standing there waiting, you know, and, on the aisle and all that stuff and a horrible organ playing. Uh, and, 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 instead, and, then, and then you would have her bridesmaids, if you will, that were these virgins that would come in too. And with the idea that, ooh, maybe they meet one of his friends and they become a wife someday themselves okay so that's the idea i'm going to read it and then and then we're actually probably going to have to finish this uh, the, this point at the uh, second class but uh, it says then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom so it's at nighttime when he comes and get them okay <clears throat> and five of them were foolish and five were prudent or wise for when the foolish ones took their lamps they took no oil with them but the prudent took oil and flasks along with the lamps. Now, when the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. In other words, you know, he, he wasn't quite ready to come pick her up. He was having too much good time with his bride, with his groomsmen. <laughs> okay. But at midnight, there was a shout, behold, the bridegroom come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. Uh, if you've never had a lamp, that means that you, you know, light it and then you got to kind of adjust it to get all the fire, right? And trimmed their lamps. <clears throat> and the foolish ones said to the prudent ones, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent ones answered, saying, No, there will not be enough for us. And you too, go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. Now it's midnight, right? Go wake somebody up, try and buy some oil, right? You know, ain't going to happen. <clears throat> okay? But they're going to try. So in verse 10, And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready, went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. So he's picked up his bride, the virgins came in, he closed the door, okay, uh, and, and shut it, and they're going to have uh, the uh, bridal party, right, the wedding feast. And later, so now these women finally got some oil, and later the other virgins also come saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. They're banging on the door, let us in, right, you know. <clears throat> but he answered and said, truly I say to you, I do not know you. Right, because they weren't there with the with the uh, bride when when he went and picked her up. Be on the alert, then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. And what we're going to get in this point is this alert is a different alert. Uh, the other alert was for the uh, believer uh, to uh, be on the alert. This alert is for the unbeliever. Be on the alert. Keep your keep your uh, 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 wick dry, your uh, lamp going, and uh, be prepared for uh, this event. Okay, so I'm going to give you what all of that means, but we won't have time to do that <clears throat> before we have to end uh, our class. Okay, so you've got the background, and now I, you know, we can go through what all of that means. Okay, so at this point, <clears throat> we're going to do true spiritual giving. Look at that! I actually did it. But I moved something. There we go. No. Play. There we go. <clears throat> and I can share my screen. See, I'm getting better at this. Okay, so the timetable and concept is given to us in 1 Corinthians 16, 2, which says, On the first day of every week, let each one of you, according to his own judgment, be putting aside and saving, according to how he might be prospering. And the idea here is that it's always based on prosperity. Uh, you're never to give sacrificially because you're destroying the memorial. Okay? <clears throat> and the other part of it is it's your decision. Remember, God's plan relies entirely uh, on your, God's plan for your life re re relies entirely on your volition. God has a perfect plan. He has uh, 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 what he desires for you. And of course, he desires all of us to become uh, mature, right? First Timothy 2, 3 and 4. But, <clears throat> but it's up to you whether that's going to happen. Same thing with true spiritual giving. Are you going to give or aren't you? Do you have prosperity or don't you? And then we have the principle and prohibition given to us in 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Each one should give just as he himself has decided what is the right amount in his heart. Not out from sorrow, pain, distress, or reluctance, nor out from compulsion. For you see, the God keeps on loving a cheerful, satisfied giver. So you're not supposed to feel guilty and therefore give. 
you know, or feel boastful and therefore give. Those are decisions based on your own emotions. Nor are you supposed to be uh, uh, <clears throat> chastised into giving, have external pressures associated with it. Gee, you know, you've been coming to this church for a long time. I've never seen any, you know, I've never seen you put your hand in the pot once, right? You know, to put something in. All I ever see you do is take it out, blah, 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 right? You know, or, or uh, you know, this church isn't going to be able to grow unless we have some money. Then we have the dictate and the promise, Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Honor the Lord from your prosperity and from the first of all your income. And if you do, your storehouses shall be filled with superabundance and your vats shall overflow with new wine. The idea being that by functioning properly, it's your choice, your volition. Okay, if you do, maybe you will, maybe you won't. But if you do, if you function properly with the prosperity that you've been giving, you're demonstrating that you know how to handle prosperity and that God uh, could give you more prosperity and you could handle that as well. And we know from Proverbs 3, <clears throat> 6, that he's going to do that or excuse me, Proverbs 10, 3, that he will do that, okay? And then we have the true wealth of God's economy is doctrine, and a very important warning given to us in 2 Corinthians 8, 12. For you see, if the eagerness, willingness, readiness is present, this is perfectly acceptable to the degree that he might be having. It is not perfectly acceptable to the degree that he is not having. The idea being that you can have the proper mental attitude, uh, but if you turn around and give sacrificially, that mental attitude is not going to be accepted as true spiritual giving. But if you don't have anything and you give the proper mental attitude, that is true spiritual giving. And then finally, you say, well, gee, I'd still like to be able to give in the, uh, uh, in the temporal area and I don't have any funds. Then you go to God in prayer. And we've studied prayer. We know the right format for prayer. We know how to make prayers effective. And so if you if you make an effective prayer, God will answer it. doesn't mean he's going to answer it yes. He may answer it yes and give you prosperity, and then you know what to do with it. Or he may answer it no, in which case you don't have prosperity, and you know that that's not in God's plan for your life at this time. And so we have God's ability to supply prosperity. 2 Corinthians 9.8. Now the God keeps on being manifestly able to richly provide all grace to you all, in order that while always having complete self-sufficiency in everything, that means he gives you everything necessary for you to function properly in his plan for your life, to fill your roles as a husband, a father, an employer, an employee, uh, you know, a child. Uh, you know, he gives you everything necessary for that. Uh, <clears throat> then it says, while also having complete self-sufficiency in everything, you all might be providing richly to every divine good work slant production. So we're going to go ahead now and give you the opportunity to go to God in prayer and exhale back to him the true wealth, the doctrine that you have, the appreciation for the doctrine and the understanding of the doctrine. And then we're also going to give you uh, the opportunity in privacy to give in the temporal area if you have been prospered and that is your decision. Let us pray.
Okay, it's just as important in the second class as it is in the first class to make sure that we're standing on worship ground. Uh, we're running a little bit late, so just give you a couple minutes to rebound, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to continue this second class, and we ask now that God, the Holy Spirit, give us everything necessary to uh, understand this information uh, and, and uh, cycle it. And we pray in Christ's name, amen. Okay, we're going to just pick it right up with subpoint little c. I gave you the first sentence. It says, we also have the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25, 1 through 13. This is a challenge to unbelievers of the tribulation to believe in Christ. Okay? In this parable, comma, so continuing the point, in this parable, the wise virgins are believers in the tribulation. Mm -hmm. In this parable, comma, the wise virgin, plural, wise virgins, are believers in the tribulation. And the unwise or foolish are the unbelievers. And you can add in the tribulation if you want, but obviously that's what I mean. So in this parable, the wise virgins are believers in the tribulation, and the unwise or foolish are the unbelievers in the tribulation. Period. The house equals the millennium. Semicolon. So in other words, they all go into the house. And the, the, un, the unbelievers, the foolish uh, virgins, can't go into the millennium, right? You know, <clears throat> that it's been locked. They can't go into the house. So that house equals the millennium, semicolon. The groom's friends are the Old Testament saints. In resurrection body, comma. The bride is the church. <clears throat> with her bridesmaids. And the bridegroom, of course, is Christ. So <clears throat> the bride is the church and the bridegroom, of course, is Christ. The virgins with oil get to enter the house slant millennium. with Christ enjoyed the Old Testament saints semicolon The foolish virgins are unbelievers who too late realize their error. And as a result, are burned up in the baptism of fire. In this passage...
the command to, quote, be on the alert, end quote, is for the unbeliever. He should accept Christ, period. In Matthew 25, oh, so, sorry, subpoint little d. Sorry, sorry, subpoint little d. I see it in my notes. I don't know why you guys don't see it. <laughs> subpoint little d. In Matthew 25, 31 through 46, or 313, 46. <laughs> well, I'm not going to change it. Get rid of this extra three. I must have fat fingered it at night. 31 through 46. Matthew 25, 31 through 46. We have another reference to the baptism of fire, comma. Specifically pointed at Gentiles, period. You can see Matthew 13 and Matthew 25 has a lot of information on the baptism of fire. So in Matthew 25, 31 through 46, we have another reference to the baptism of fire specifically pointed at Gentiles, period. Here the phrase, quote, in his glory, end quote, equates to the second advent. I'll read it in a second here, but I'm gonna, I'm, I need to give you a little bit of this information before I read it so you understand what I'm going to read. Okay, so the phrase, in his glory, equates to the second advent. The phrase translated in most general translators as, quote, all the nations will be gathered end quote, should say, quote, all the Gentiles will be gathered, period, end quote. See, the Greek word that we have there is ethnos. And ethnos can mean, uh, it can be a race, it can mean the Gentiles, it can mean, it can mean a nation. But here the Lord Jesus Christ is specifically talking about, uh, this, par this parallel, uh, excuse me, this uh, passage is about uh, uh, the, the Gentile baptism of fire, if you will. Okay. <clears throat> and so uh, the phrase translated to most general translators is all the nations will be gathered should say all the Gentiles will be gathered. Okay. So here's the passage that says, <clears throat> but when the Son of Man comes in his glory, that's the rapture, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne, and all the Gentiles will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right hand. And I'm going to give you this, but obviously you figured out since the right hand, that's the, the, the uh, uh, place of honor. He's talking about the sheep being believers, right? He will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you are blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. Naked <clears throat> and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Now, this is a passage that a lot of pastors use for the reason why they've got to go to hospitals, and they've got to go to prisons, and they've got to go. Uh, you know, This is not what this is talking about. I'm going to tell you what this is talking about. Because 
even these people said, huh? Verse 37, then the righteous will answering and saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? So they're going like, huh? <laughs> and the king will answer and say to them, truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Now, what we're going to see is since this is talking about the baptism of fire, it's talking about the tribulation. It's talking about the time during the tribulation. And this is talking about the treating of the 144,000 evangelists that automatically, uh, very quickly, accept right after the, the, uh, the uh, uh, rapture. Okay, so it's how were these people treated during the tribulation by believers? They accepted and then they treated these evangelists properly. Okay, verse 41 or verse 40. And the king will answer, okay, even the least of them you did to me. Verse 41. Then he will also say to those on his left, remember those are the goats, okay? Depart from me, you cursed one, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry. And you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in naked and you did not clothe me sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they themselves also will say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? And then he will answer them saying, truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Okay. <clears throat> Continuing. The point, excuse me, the sheep, continuing the point, the sheep equates to believers who go into the millennium. And the goats to unbelievers who go through the baptism of fire. It's very easy to look at this also as a, as a great white throne judgment verse, okay? <clears throat> but the great white throne judgment, these same individuals are going to end up going through the great white throne judgment, okay? But we get the key when we talk about him coming down because he's coming down at the second advent. Okay, the Lord doesn't come down at the end of the millennium, right? <clears throat> He's already here. So uh, this has to be dealing with the second advent and not with the uh, great white throne judgment. Okay. <clears throat> the sheep equates to believers. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> since they get put on the right hand and will ultimately go into the millennium. And the goats are unbelievers who go through the baptism of fire. Note that verses 34 through 40. Note that in verses 34 through 40, the Lord is talking to the believers about the 144,000 evangelists that occur right after the rapture. and evangelize until the baptism <clears throat> of fire. Okay, he's talking about 144 evangelists that occur right after the rapture and evangelize until the baptism of fire. The believers don't understand this at first. And he has to explain it to them. So the quote, these brothers, end quote, in verse 40,
refer to these in evangelists. Revelation 7, 4 through 8. And 14, 1 through 5. Four, uh, Revelation 4, I mean 7, 4 says, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. And then 5 through 8 just tells you how it's divided amongst the various tribes. Okay, and then 14, <clears throat> 1 through 5. Uh, it says, uh, the Lamb and the 144,000 on Mount Zion. And it talks, it talks about them. Okay. <clears throat> then he talks, continuing the point, then the Lord talks to the goats, or unbelievers, with reference to the same evangelists. And we see that the <clears throat> and we see that the unbelievers go into eternal punishment. Okay. Last point, subpoint Lily. And finally, in Ezekiel twenty, thirty four through thirty eight. There's the concept of a Jewish baptism of fire. There will be Jews who are saved and go into the millennium. as well as those who remain unsaved and will perish. <clears throat> so starting at verse 33, I'll wait till you guys finish writing, I'm sorry. The point finally in Ezekiel 20, 34 through 38, there's the concept of a Jewish baptism of fire. There will be Jews who are saved and go into the millennium and those who are unsaved and will perish. Strong at verse 33, we have, As I live, declares the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, I shall be king over you. And I shall bring you out <clears throat> from the peoples and gather you from the lands where you are scattered with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out. And I shall bring you into the wilderness of the people and there I, sh I shall enter into judgment with you face to face. As I enter into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord. And I shall make you pass under the rod and I shall bring you into the bond of the covenant. And I shall purge you from the rebels and those who transgress against me. I shall bring out them out of the land where they sojourn, but they will not enter the land of Israel. Thus you will know that I am the Lord. So again, you have those who are going to make it into the land and those who are not. 
Okay, and so that's an Old Testament understanding of <clears throat> the baptism of fire. Okay? So I just wanted to cover that because we haven't really talked a lot about the different parables and we, we don't spend a whole lot of time, particularly in the Synoptic Gospels, because uh, primarily so much of the Synoptic Gospel is not pertinent to us. Uh, remember, a lot of the Synoptic Gospels were still written uh, during the, uh, the times of the Jews. The church age hadn't started yet. Okay, and uh, and then uh, there's this transition, and so it talks about that, and then it also goes forward and talks about the kingdom, and it talks about the millennium, and it talks about those kinds of things. And so, uh, anyway, these are passages now that give you a better understanding of the baptism of fire, so that we can understand what Peter is talking about. Uh, although he's talking about the great white throne of the judgment, we understand that the baptism of fire must come first. Okay, so verse seven. Whoops, all together which apparently I didn't do. Verse 7 altogether should say you should have, but the present heavens and earth by means of this same, and that's underlined word, keep on having been reserved, and that's underlined for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and of destruction of the ungodly men. Now we're ready to go into verse 8. And verse 8 is actually, like I said last week, is going to start a new section where Peter's going to tell us about God's timetable and what we should expect. Uh, it's very clear that the Lord's timetable, not ours. Remember, never get ahead of the Lord's timetable. The Lord's timetable is perfect. We have the attack of the Hamas on Israel, uh, and we look at it, and there's horrible atrocities going on and horrible things that are happening. But we have to understand God has allowed that to happen, and it's his timetable. We don't know what's coming next. Many times this kind of thing uh, brings out strength, reinforces strength. Many times it's a way to uh, remove evil. It's a time to wake people up, to understand that, oh, I need God. I need strength in my life. Where do I get courage? Well, I get courage because I have confidence in God. Right? That's, that's the message that we should be presenting as we give the gospel. Right? You give the gospel first to give them the, the information about the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, And then if they accept and they told you that they accept, then you can start giving them some information regarding getting doctrine, getting information, so that they can have courage, so that they can handle these things. I have no idea how you handle these things without any, without any doctrine. And the idea is you don't. There's two mechanisms. right? We have fight or flight. You have people who ignore it. They don't want to watch the news. They don't want to read anything. They don't want to know anything about what's going on in the world because they can't handle it. Or they get angry and they want to fight. right? And then, and then you have uh, all kinds of explosions of, of violence that make no sense either. Okay. So <clears throat> as, a, as a believer, as a mature believer, you have to develop patience first. See, patience is an attribute of maturity. Uh, if you remember, we went through probably a couple years ago now, we went through some of the attributes of maturity. One of them is patience. You can't be patient as a, as a baby believer. You want everything to happen now, right? It's like your kids. You know, when you have kids, they want it to happen now. I want to go to the store. I want to go to the party. I want to go to whatever. And, you, and as a parent, you say, okay, well, we'll go in just a minute. I got to finish this up. No, no, no. I'm going to miss something. I'm going to miss something. They're afraid constantly of missing something, right? Okay. They have no patience. It's the same thing with a baby believer. If you aren't patient for God's timetable, then that's good information for you. That tells you that you need to get more doctrine and grow a little bit more so that you can have that patience. And we have to see what's going on. We have to have patience for that. We have to have patience. Patience, though, also gives you preparedness, right? Things may happen in this nation. We need to be prepared. Doesn't mean we instigate, but we need to be prepared. Okay, so verse 8, we're going to see the Lord's timetable. That's not our timetable. And it's something that we need to remember both in our prayers and in our lives. Now, remember, God has, if you think of it, two levels, really, of timetables. You have historical events that are going to happen to great masses of people. Things like the baptism of fire, things like, uh, you know, the end of the millennium, the great white throne judgment, things like, uh, you know, uh, going into eternity. Those, those things are, are one level of God's uh, timetable. 
And we don't know when those are going to happen, but we have to have confidence that they're going to happen because we have confidence in our God. He is omnipotent. He's omniscient. He knows exactly when his plan is supposed to be done. That's one level of timetable. But then we don't look at it and say, oh, well, he's forgot about me. You have the other level of his timetable. He has made promises to us. He's made specific promises to you. You've prayed for things, right? You've prayed properly. You have every right to expect an answer. He's not going to give you an answer after you're dead. Okay. <laughs> oh, I forgot to answer so-and-so. I guess I better get on it, right? <laughs> so, so he has a timetable that's relative to you, a personal timetable that's uh, his plan specifically for you. You have to have patience for both. You have to have patience for the long term, but you also have to have patience for his responses to your prayers, his timetable for you. But you have to have confidence in both cases. You have to have confidence that the world still has at least a thousand years and a thousand and seven years left, right? That confidence is very, very uh, encouraging. It means that there's not anything we're going to do to destroy the earth. There's great confidence in that. But you also have confidence that the things that you prayed for are going to be like I said, they're not going to be answered after you're dead. They're going to be answered in God's time, but it's going to be perfect time for you. Okay? So this gives us further confidence in, in God and courage, of course, for our daily lives. Okay? So verse 8 starts off. Now stop letting this one truth escape your notice, comma. And truth is in parents with a single line through it. Now stop letting this one truth escape your notice, comma. We start off with a coordinating conjunction, de, D-E. And de means and, but, now, depending on how it's used. And here, the best translation, since we're slightly changing context, is now. So Peter's dropping a, a little bit of the information associated with the, with the uh, Great White Throne Judgment, and he's changing topic a little bit. But So it's, it's now. Then this is followed by a present active imperative, third person singular of a negated verb, lontano. No matter how many times I change it, I still get autocorrect, giving me lanthanum. <laughs> anyway, lontano. And this verb means to succeed in avoiding attention or awareness. To escape notice or to be hidden. In the active voice, the idea is to let something escape your notice. And it's negated with <clears throat> the negative may, meaning not. And when the negative is attached to the present imperative, it usually indicates a prohibition on action that's already in process. It's interesting. I have a, a, new, uh, a new grammar. It's called uh, Greek Beyond the Basics by an individual named Mounts, who's a, or excuse me, by an individual who's named, uh, yeah, my mind just went blank. Anyway, what? Doesn't matter. Uh, but but he's he you know this used to be the rule, okay? Uh, that when it's this way, and he's shown some cases where that rule uh, doesn't necessarily happen, okay? But uh, <clears throat> it is almost always associated with stopping something rather than than uh, not starting, okay? So when you have a negative with the present imperative indicates prohibition, so we have stop rather than don't start, okay? These individuals are already doing this, and they need to stop it. Then we have the neuter nominative singular of the pronoun hutos, H-O-U-T-O-S, 
meaning this, this one or this thing. And it's combined with the neuter nominative singular of an adjective, heis. This looks a lot like ice, the difference being that the accent uh, looks like a, a quote mark uh, is a curve to the is a curve to the right, which gives us a long, I mean a, a hard breathing, heis. The word ice meaning in, into, or toward it has the breathing mark direction. So it's important to understand the accents. Anyway, this is heis. Heis means one. Okay. And so we have this one. And in context, Peter uh, is going to give us a true statement. So we need to fill in the actual noun, which is truth. So we have this one truth. And then we have the last word of the phrase, which is the accusative plural of the second person personal pronoun, su, which I didn't put up there. Uh, it's su. You all know what it looks like. Su. And combined with the action of the verb, it acts as a modifier. So we have stop letting this one truth escape your notice. And so, as we'll see in the analysis, the idea is that there's two ways to stop, uh, there's two ways to let something escape your notice. One is to never notice it in the first place and by ignoring it. Okay, and the other one is by forgetting it. Okay, uh, I know it, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to worry about remembering it. Right? He's talking about both of these, as we'll see. And then we have beloved, comma. That with the Lord. I kind of chopped it up a little bit weird here, but we'll make it through. Beloved, comma. That with the Lord. <clears throat> It just seemed like it was getting too long if I said, now stop letting this one truth escape your notice, beloved. Although I probably should have. We start here, as you'd expect, it's a masculine vocative plural of the adjective agapetos. It's used as a substantive. A-G-A-P long E T-O-S, agapetos. It's cognitive agape, A-G-A-P long E. Agape, we know, means love. And as a substantive, it means ones who are loved or beloved. Next, we have what we'd expect, since I translated it that, the word that's usually translated that is haughty, and that's what we have here, haughty, meaning because, since, or that. And here the best translation is that. Next, we have the preposition para plus the dative. Now, para in its basic form, usually with the genitive, and para means uh, from, and it means from the ultimate source of, right? Well, we have it here in the dative, and so the best way to translate it with the dative is with, but it still can, it still uh, keeps that idea from the ultimate source. So, <clears throat> what we're going to see here, and I bring it out in the analysis, so I'm all kinds of previews of coming attractions. But what we're going to see here is we're talking about with the Lord, we're talking about from the ultimate source of the Lord. Okay, We get our days, what we're going to see is he gives us one day is the same as a thousand. Uh, he gives us our days. We don't, we don't create our own days. right? The days come with the Lord. But anyway, so we have with, and then we have the masculine data singular of the anarthrist noun kudios, meaning Lord or Master. And here in context, uh, Lord, remember, and can be used, for any of the three members of the Trinity, uh, we have uh, we have uh, uh, parts of the New Testament where Lord is used for God the Holy Spirit as well as the Lord Jesus Christ. And here, this Lord is referring to God the Father as the creator of the plan because we're talking about the plan here. And God the Father is the creator of the plan, so this is Lord is God the Father. And you can put that in brackets if you want so that it doesn't get confused with the Lord Jesus Christ. I didn't because I'm telling you it, but uh, you can if you need it. Okay, the context and the lack of an article tells us that the reader understands who's being spoke of, spoken of, uh, but we need to go ahead and add the article. In other words, we don't say beloved that with Lord, with the Lord. One day, the 
And this starts with a feminine nominative singular of the cardinal number Heis, once again. Oh, it's in feminine, it looks like Mia, in case you have a, a Greek interlinear, you're going to see Mia, M-I-A, but it means one. See, poor kids, uh, poor little kids in uh, Greek, they have to learn both cardinal numbers and ordinal numbers, both in masculine, feminine, and neuter. So you don't just go one, two, three, four, five. You need to know one, two, three, four, five in masculine, <laughs> feminine, and neuter. And then you need first, second, third, fourth, and fifth, also in masculine, feminine, and neuter. <laughs> and they change forms, okay? Anyway, heist means one, or mia in this case. It's followed by the feminine nominative singular of the noun hemera, which we've seen many times. And it means literally day is that period between sunset and sunrise. We know it has extended meanings, but here the context is a 24-hour period or a single revolution of Earth. And so we simply have one day or one 24-hour period is as a thousand years. Peter skips the status quo verb. In the Greek, it just says... <clears throat> Uh, one day, a thousand years, or as a thousand years. So Peter skips the status quo verb, but we know we need it because we have a predicate nominative. And uh, predicate nominatives mean that it's after a status quo verb, so we add it back in with parentheses. We then have the comparative particle, hos, which we expect. H long O S. Hos. Hos means like or as. Can sometimes mean while or occurring. Here the basic meaning is a context, so we translate it as as. And then we have a neuter nominative plural of another adjective, kilioi. C-H-I-L-I-O-I, kilioi. And it's the cardinal number thousand. This adjective modifies the neuter nominative plural of another noun, etos, E-T-O-S, and etos means a year, in the plural, years. So we have, is as a thousand years. And finally, we're going to have two more pieces. The first piece says, in a thousand years, You could probably fill in the blanks. You know enough Greek now. If you've just written it down for the last 10 minutes, you could probably fill in exactly what this is. First, you have the conjunction, which we would expect. Chi gives us and. And then we have a neuter nominative plural of an adjective I just gave you. Kilioi, meaning a thousand, and etos, meaning years. And then finally, so we have in a thousand years, is as one day. Again, we have the elliptical status quo verb because we have predicate nominatives that are coming. Once again, we have the comparative particle. I can point to you guys, you'd all yell out hosts and you'd get it right. <laughs> Giving us as followed by the feminine nominative singular of the cardinal number, once again, heis, meaning one, followed by a feminine nominative singular noun, hemera, still meaning day, or 24-hour period. So all together, see that? We already did one whole verse. So all together, we have now stop letting this one truth escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. And that's going to leave us ready for an analysis. We only have five minutes left and we still have singing to do. So we will pick up with the analysis next week.